The 2024 NBA playoffs are here, and of course that means that I got to do a couple of series previews, and I'm going to be starting with the Dallas Mavericks versus Los Angeles Clippers series, because to me this is easily the most interesting first round series in the entirety of the playoffs. Of course, there is a long history of these two teams matching up, or at least specifically Luka Doncic versus this Clippers core of Kawhi and Paul George. Obviously, there's different context to these rosters than in the previous two times that they matched up, but the legacy of the rivalry is there, and I expect a lot of excellent moments to come out of this series. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Oscar Rusty Bucket. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already, and drop a like on this video. It only takes one second. It makes a massive difference in how the video performs in the YouTube algorithm. So the way that we're going to be doing these breakdowns is we're going to talk about their regular season matchups, then get into their matchups, how players are going to be defending each other, the defensive schemes, things like that. X factors for each team, any other notes that I have, and then we're going to do the final prediction at the end. So with that, we're going to start with the series stats where on the season, uh, the Mavericks have lost the Clippers two times. One of those losses, to be fair, was without Kyrie Irving, and I believe that was the game that is the blowout here. That's the 19-point win for the Clippers. Uh, a nine-point win in December. Also, so these teams have not played each other since the Dallas Mavericks had their traded line, which dramatically changed the roster with the addition of Daniel Gafford and PJ Washington. That Mavericks team has just been a way better Mavericks team than uh, teams of the past, uh, the team of even earlier this season. So take that for what you will in, in terms of this matchup data. The one game that the Dallas Mavericks did end up winning, though, was an in-season tournament game, which does tell me that just the more competitive environment, the Mavericks were the team that ended up prevailing in that more competitive environment. Luka Doncic on the season, remarkably, these are worse numbers than what he normally averages but he averages 34 points, six rebounds, almost seven assists, uh, only shoots 32% from three, only 74% from the line, and a 61% true shooting percentage. Kyrie Irving in the two games that he played actually has some pretty remarkable stats, while his efficiency isn't like jump off the stat, off the sheet good. He has high volume, you know, he's at 26 and a half points per game, three assists, which isn't great, but that is taking 20 field goal attempts to get to 26 points, but that's not a terrible ratio and he is also shooting shooting 50 percent from three on i guess the 16 total attempts he took versus them this year tim hardaway jr sucks versus the clippers in the three games that he played 16 points on 16 shots 25 percent from three also just to get into some other stats as for like how these teams have played post trade deadline tim hardaway jr eight points per game on 35 31 74 splits so he has been absolute garbage <laughs> ever since uh that deadline as much as the rest of the mavericks have been good he has very much not been i'm actually curious as to how much he's going to end up playing in the postseason as a result of that because tim has played a pivotal factor in this matchup before against the clippers in the past there's been times where he was like basically the maverick second option which does say a lot about how poorly those rosters were constructed and and how much Kristaps Porzingis like did not show up in one of those series. I think he showed up in one and not the other and it was Tim Hardaway who was like picking up the slack. I'm not really expecting that to happen now. Luckily there are more options, specifically Kyrie Irving. Um, I just started <laughs> making a noise to get a cat's attention in the middle of that sentence. Jesus. Yeah, I, I, I skipped over what the Clippers average. Basically, very normal things for them, pretty close to their season averages. James Harden is only at 13 points on 34%, so that's not good. Kawhi Leonard averaging 21 points per game is a little bit less than the season average. So, you know, no one's doing great other than Russ. Russ does shoot 55% from the field in the three games he's played against them, so that's good in about 23 minutes of action averaging 13 6 and 4 and about two steals so he's definitely uh putting up the numbers against the mavericks this year but in general nothing too outlandish if anything these guys are not as impressive against each other as they are otherwise um, which I guess stands to reason, given that these are two of the better teams in the NBA. But also, the Mavericks were not necessarily that to start the year, nor were they a great defensive team. So it is a little bit puzzling that this matchup is uh, yielding negative numbers for the Clippers players. But I digress.
progress. Not too much, I think, to take away in the case of these teams. I am interested in the fact that that play-in game, not the play-in game, the, the in-season tournament game went so heavily in Dallas's favor. They won that one 144 to 126. Luka Doncic had, I think, if not a 40-piece, a 50-piece. Not too much to read into other than that, again, because that Dallas Mavericks team is very different since the start of the season when these teams faced off. So with that, let's get into the matchups and specifically how these guys are going to be defended. Uh, first things first, you got to talk about the Luka Doncic matchup and my hot take of this series. I think Paul George needs to defend Luka the entire series. Paul George, maybe not quite the defender that he was two, three years ago. He definitely seems to have had somewhat of a minor decline over the last two seasons or so. Nothing that like jumps off of the stat sheet to you, but like it's clear his numbers are going down. Obviously, there's less of a role for him as time has gone on, specifically with the addition of James Harden. He's doing a lot more off ball stuff, but his numbers otherwise have just been fine. You know, he's not an all NBA player this year. He wasn't an all star this year, which is cool. You know, I'm not really saying like Paul George sucks or anything, but in the past, during these matchups, Paul and Kawhi, they would seldom defend Luka Doncic. In fact, they really would only defend him towards the end of the game because they were saving their energy for their offensive output. Because if Kawhi and Paul George are not having positive offensive games, the Clippers are probably not winning. So they need to have the energy for the offensive end of the floor. And defending Luka Doncic is a very exhausting task. So realistically, you want to give that job to a role player. But at the same time, Kawhi and Paul George are also the best defensive matchup against Luka Doncic that this team has to offer. Really nobody else that I can think of that is more than just competent in that matchup. Probably Terrence Mann, I imagine, will get a lot of Luka minutes, and that's fine. He's not too undersized. He's a strong enough defender. But Paul George has the size, and he's a very good defender. And while in the past, they needed Paul for that offensive punch, they don't so much need that anymore because James Harden is really the secondary creator after Kawhi Leonard. Paul is still doing some shot creation for himself and for his teammates, but for the most part, that is left up James and Kawhi first and foremost. And then Paul is more or less playing off of the ball. So I think you can sacrifice Paul's offense a little bit. Like even looking at the regular season matchup, Paul did miss one of the games. 16 and a half points per game. You know, one of those was a win. One of them was a loss. You, you're capable of winning with Paul George not really having an excellent performance. Uh, not really stuffing the stat sheet. But Kawhi and James, I think you let them do that. You let James dominate with his playmaking. You let Kawhi dominate with his scoring. And then Paul can just be a catch and shoot guy someone who does some other creation i'm not saying he just doesn't do anything on offense anymore you don't value his offense his offensive ability to the point where you're not going with that matchup on Luka Doncic, which I think is the most favorable one. Really, I think the best thing you can do against Luka is just give the best one-on-one -on -one matchup you can, and then try your best not to bring two to the ball too often. He is, of course, too dominant of a one-on-one -on -one scorer to just never do that. He also is such a dominant passer that he's almost always making the right read, and this time around he has teammates that can actually finish the plays that he sets up so I would be cautious about the double teams be very selective with them he's the most blitzed player in the entire NBA which doesn't really make sense to me because he's making those reads but outside of that that's really all I think you can do with Luka just Paul is a big strong talented defender and he can put his energy on that matchup now because he has a less offensive responsibility than he did in the past as for how Kyrie gets defended Defended. Uh, that one, I haven't even really put much thought to that, but they don't have a lot of strong options there. I do think if you put Paul on Luka, you can then afford to put Terrence Mann on Kyrie Irving. I think Kyrie might have a small speed advantage on Terrence Mann, but I really don't think it's enough to like break the matchup by any means. So I would probably do that. Paul on Luka, Terrence on Kyrie as your initial matchups. As for the scheme of the defense as a whole, defending the Mavericks, how much of a factor is Zubats going to be in this one? You know, they have 
I feel like they rely on him more than they did in the past. They don't have Isaiah Hartenstein coming off of the bench anymore, who's more of a versatile center, quicker on his feet, really. So you don't really have that working for you. You also don't have like the Marcus Morris, or maybe it was Mark Heath. I think it's Marcus Morris. Small ball five option, you know, because he's like 6'9 and pretty strong, like he could play center. Don't really have a strong small ball five option at your disposal here. Maybe you're just going really small and you're throwing another wing in there, or you're bringing Russ in there, and you're asking Kawhi or Paul George to be your center. I could see that working in some contexts, but I could also see Daniel Gafford just getting a bunch of offensive rebounds and alley-oops because no one can physically match up against him with that. So I don't know if that's the move. So yeah, I think the X factor, if we can move on to that real quick for the Mavericks, I guess it's kind of a skipping ahead, but probably Zubats. Uh, his ability to defend, on whether it's on the drop, whether it's on the switch on Luka, being able to get a hand up on the pull-ups, not just getting completely completely burned and left in the dust and getting stranded on an island and, and too far away from the paint. Really, I think the Clippers just need to do everything in their power not to allow that switch to happen, which I know at times in the past, it really seemed like they didn't work that hard to prevent the switch. I remember this wasn't a switch on to Vucevic, not Vucevic, Zubats, but the game winner that he hit in the bubble on the Clippers, I think it was Paul or Kawhi was defending him initially and they were just like all too happy to let them switch the matchup on the inbound to Reggie Jackson, who he can just shoot right over, uh, and then he hit a game winner on them. Um, so yeah, don't do shit like that. You gotta do your best not to switch. I realize that in the modern NBA, switching has just become more and more prevalent, but sometimes it's worth it to just fight through the screen, even if you're at the risk of like getting some fouls here or there for it, I think it's worth doing that. But yeah, that's that's all I have to say about how the Clippers defend the Mavericks. As for how the Mavericks defend the Clippers, I am curious what the Kawhi matchup is. Actually, there's more options for this than I initially thought there were. Maxi Kleba in the past had success defending Kawhi. I think PJ Washington can physically match up against him pretty well. If anything, he's a little bit bigger than Kawhi. Derek Jones Jr. as well off of the bench is a very good option. Josh Green is a little short, but he can probably do an all right job uh Dante Exum also a little bit short but can probably do an all right job um there's actually more positive defenders on this Mavericks team than I initially gave credit for um and I think they can do a decent job matching Kawhi matching Paul and because they got the smaller guard smaller players with Josh Green and uh Dante Exum they're both 6'5 they're pretty strong I think they can handle the James Harden matchup uh, I think they actually have some pretty good one-on-one -on -one matchups. You can put Luka on uh, Terrence Mann. Um, so since the traded line, Terrence Mann has shot 40% from three, but on the season in general, he hasn't shot the three ball well. So I think you could theoretically have Luka take that matchup and then like have him roam a little bit, you know, just being a 6'8", intelligent, knows how to play passing lanes wing. I could see like, also just having like Derek Jones Jr. or PJ Washington, whoever you don't have on the Kawhi or Paul George matchup, having them just be more of a freelancer and trying to interact with uh, the passing lanes. Um, you've got two big men who I think, you know, they do similar things, Gafford and Lively, but at the very least, they move their feet well and the things that they do, you know, it's things that you like to have reliably, which means the Mavericks reliably have solid rebounding, a really good lob option and good rim protection all the time. That's pretty great. So I think they're not gonna have much issue defending the paint all that well. And they have some pretty good perimeter options. I was actually surprised, like in my head, I was like, damn, do the, do the Mavericks have anybody who can defend this team? And I was like, actually kind of, yeah. Uh, which is why their defense has been a lot better of late because they actually have some pretty solid defenders. But yeah, I'm gonna move on from the matchups. That's really all I got to say about that. As for the X factors, as I mentioned for the Clippers, I'm gonna go with Zubats in that one. I really feel like whether or not he is, you know, getting burned by Luca just every possession because he can contribute things on both ends of the floor and they also the Clippers don't have a great alternative option I wasn't quite this 
sure of how lacking in that option they were until I actually pondered it. And that's actually a, potentially a huge hole for this team. Moving on though, beyond him for the uh, Mavericks, I think my X factor is gonna be Tim Hardaway Jr. just because he's been so bad against them and he's been big for them in the past. So ideally, if he's actually going to play a lot, he will hit his shots. Uh, how much he actually plays, I do not know, because really the true X factor of the series is Jason Kidd. And as much as I like how the Mavericks match up with the Clippers more than I like how the Clippers match up with the Mavericks, I also like Tyron Liu as a head coach a lot more than I do Jason Kidd. And I feel like the difference in their competence at their job could make split the difference otherwise with the matchups. As for like the philosophies of these teams, which I think is better you know the Clippers have a more egalitarian approach they have a lot of different guys making plays lots of different guys shot creating between Paul James Kawhi Russ when he gets in the game uh, Norman Powell does a little bit of shot creation himself and I think this is a relatively deep roster really but for both of these teams, I think these are fairly deep rosters. The Mavericks are top heavy. Uh, Luka Doncic is easily the best player in this series. Uh, no offense to Kawhi, but you know, he's he's shown in the past that he can elevate to a level close to Luka. Uh, so he could potentially do that again. He's had a relatively whatever season this year. You know, he's actually played and been healthy. So blessing in that regard, but like otherwise 23.4 points per game is not a lot of points in the modern NBA while Luka is averaging like 36. Uh, but yeah, Luka, they got the best player in the series. Um, I think they have the best second option in the series. At this point, I think Kyrie is better than Paul George. I think he's a little bit better than James Harden. Um, not by, I don't think Kyrie's like by a wide margin better there. And of course the Clippers have the better third player. I'm actually looking down like the matchup stats here and we have Luka and then Kyrie and then it's Tim Hardaway Jr. Meanwhile, I'm seeing Kawhi, Paul George, James Harden, Russell Westbrook, some real heavy hitters here. Uh, because after these two, it really just is a bunch of role players and play finishers. So, you know, is the lead guy taking the brunt of the offense, doing all of the playmaking, more or less, doing almost all of the shot creation, and then just one other guy doing a lot of shot creation? That plus just role players finishing plays, is that better or is it just more people being able to create, but also not necessarily in as dominant or unstoppable of a way? Just because with Luka Doncic, the shots and the assists are just raining in on you. They are hitting over and over and over again. Whereas I feel like for the Clippers, just because there's no elite playmaking, the offense can stagnate quite a bit. James Harden brings, I guess James Harden can be elite playmaking a lot, but just because he's also not as dominant of a scoring presence, it's not as impactful as it would be otherwise. I'm not going to go in my whole offense or my whole playmaking and scoring relationship spiel, uh, but James Harden was definitely a more dominant playmaker in the past than he is now. But still, uh, they definitely got an upgrade in that department, but there is overall a more even share of the pie while Luka Doncic is doing a large majority of the creation and then Kyrie is doing a large majority of whatever creation Luca's not that's that's basically all my other notes for my prediction I'm going with the Dallas Mavericks I think the Dallas Mavericks are the second best team in the Western Conference I don't know if I've said that on this channel yet but I really truly believe that they have the best chance of getting out of the West I think they can go I think if there's any team in the league that could beat the Nuggets or compete with the Nuggets at the very least it's the Dallas Mavericks because if there's any player in the league that can go shot for shot assist for assist basically rebound for rebound with Jokic if there's any player that can do that it's Luka freaking Doncic and I know it's kind of cliche to just go well you got the best player in the series therefore you're going to win I really feel like there is just such a significant gap between Luka and Kawhi if I was doing a top 10 players in the league right now Luka Doncic is number two and Kawhi might not be in my top 10 uh, he probably will be a top 10 postseason performer. So for what that's worth, just not just factoring in what he is in the regular season, but what he can bring in the postseason because Kawhi is, of course, a playoff killer. That said, Luka 
I think, just has a huge edge on him. Kyrie is the best second option, and while there is a coaching discrepancy, I do think that the best player factor will ultimately decide it. And also, like, I don't know, I kind of like the way that the Mavericks play more. I like that more top-heavy play style. Uh, while I like everybody being able to play make, I also don't like not having generational playmaking on your side. Again, I'm not disrespecting James Harden because at his peak, he was truly a generational playmaker, but because he doesn't score like he used to, he also doesn't quite pass like he used to. But yeah, I'm gonna go Mavericks. Credit to where it's due, the Clippers were better this regular season, and even though they didn't close the season super strong, actually, that's another thing I should probably mention. The Clippers ended the season poorly, and and the Mavericks ended the season fantastically. Like, my opinion of these two teams could not be more polar opposite of what it was three months ago. So, yeah, that is a factor to mention. But the Clippers, I expect to be competitive. I am going to go Mavericks in six. I'm going to kind of say this score the same way that I do movie scores. I'm going to say closer to five games than seven. Um, maybe that's a little disrespectful to the Clippers, but honestly, I think the Mavericks probably will not have that much trouble. I think Luka will finally get his white whale, and I think the Mavericks can go a lot farther than I think some people expect. I know there's a lot more hype for them lately, but uh, I'm still feeling like I believe more than most people do. Also, real quick to end this, I forgot to mention in the intro I was going to do this. I want to do the play-in prediction with the new context. Uh, so I went one for four on my first four play-in predictions. So uh, already these matchups are not what I expected to happen. So I guess that technically means I go 0 for six because also just if the matchups aren't there, then it's not even something that you could have guessed but i am going to uh nonetheless even though i keep getting it wrong try to take a guess for what's going to happen with these last two games that are happening tomorrow which is the new orleans pelicans versus the sacramento kings and the chicago bulls versus the miami heat uh, so first thing, on the Bulls end of things, uh, no Alice Caruso more likely than not, but for the Heat, no Jimmy Butler. I think the Bulls will win for that reason. I think this Bulls team is better than the Heat without Jimmy, which is kind of crazy to think, but honestly, I don't feel like Bam's going to step up to the degree that he would need to, nor will Tyler Hero. He just had an absolute stinker. You know, it's not impossible. Don't get me wrong. Like, if you got a good Tyler Hero game and a good bam out of bio game i think you can beat the bulls but i think you need both of them to have good games and i feel like the consistency in which they both do that is not that much i feel like you're getting one or the other um having more shots to go around for the both of them with no jimmy could make a big difference but nevertheless you know maybe jaime Hawkes can step up kevin love maybe Maybe you get Duncan Robinson in this game where he didn't play in the last game because apparently he was still recovering from an injury to some degree. Whatever that may be, though, I think the Bulls are going to win that one, um, which means I think they're going to get the privilege of getting molly by the Celtics in round one. And then on the Kings versus Pelicans end of things, the Kings really impressed me in that Warriors game for sure, but they maybe didn't impress me as much as the Warriors baffled me and shocked me for how bad they were. Meanwhile, the Pelicans very nearly beat the Lakers when the Lakers have had their number this entire season. Zion showcased an ability to elevate his game that we had not seen to this point because he really hasn't been in a context like this. My gut's telling me the Pelicans, uh, I'm not getting into the matchup for either of these things because this video i'm at looking at 27 minutes right now i've yapped enough i'm gonna go with the pelicans which means the pelicans will be playing the timberwolves no no not the timberwolves the timberwolves were the third seed who was the first seed who was the okc thunder yeah the okc thunder thunder versus pelicans that's interesting i i fuck with that all right uh that's it shout out to rudy for editing this video and goodbye